Blessed be your name In the land that is plentiful Where streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name Blessed be your name When I'm found in the desert place Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name And every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the dark Lord, blessed be your name You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name
to me to fix my eyes on things above and not on what I see and in the deepest struggle in the face of great defeat my unfair advantage is that Jesus stands with me and all it ever takes is a very nice to meet you so welcome thank you um how did you get to come to front and gospel chapel right nice to be with you guys it's uh, lovely to be here the first time i've been here for a meeting and uh it's really nice to be here but how did i come to be in not frinton but wharton i'm not posh I come from Wharton. I actually live in Columbine Gardens and I retired there 12 years ago 
when I retired from the London City Mission. Does anybody know the London City Mission? And I worked in the London City Mission for 33 years and served mainly in North London, in Tottenham. And then we did a 12-year stint in Lewisham. And I also did about a four-year stint in Covent Garden. But during my mission career, I was mainly running mission centres about the size of this building here. So I feel quite at home here. <laughs> it's a nice little setting. It's a chapel. It's more like a mission hall setting. And uh, I joined the mission in 1979 and uh, was appointed to Tottenham and worked, as I've said, for several years in Tottenham. And I owe such a, mo such a lot to the London City Mission under God because I have a rich heritage in my family of London City Mission involvement. I know you guys as a church are going out onto the district, which is what we do in the London City Mission, and how important that is that you're connecting with people not just in here, but outside. And that's what we were doing for 33 years. But my heritage in the mission is that my nan on my mum's side was converted many decades ago in a London City Mission Hall. That's my nan. And then my mum was converted in a London City Mission Hall. And my wife, who's not with me this morning, we go to St Mary's, she's over the road. But my wife was converted when she was 11 years old in a London City Mission Hall in Hoxton. Does anybody know Hoxton? <laughs> and my dad served in the London City Mission for over 40 years. And my two kids, Debbie and David, who are now adults with families of their own, they were both saved during our stint in the London City Mission. So under God, thank you, Lord, for the London City Mission. <laughs> thank you. All right. And how were you brought to the Lord? Well, I'm going to talk about that this morning. Okay, I'll right. leave so you to talk about that this morning. She, she wants to take my sermon away. <laughs> Okie dokie. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, as I said. And I purposely chose that reading because it's the shortest of three parables in Luke, in Luke 15. You've got the parable of the lost sheep. Then you've got the parable of the lost coin. Then you've got the parable of the lost son. I am the third one, okay? And I want to talk about my testimony this morning. I prayed about what to share, and I normally bring a message with, you know, three points or whatever from a, from a particular passage, but I felt quite strongly that the Lord wanted me to share how I came to know the Lord as the son of a London City missionary, because that's what I was. My dad was out there on the streets and in the different localities where he worked, and he was going out to share the gospel. But like a lot of Christian families, sadly, the family situation doesn't always go very smoothly. If I were to ask, you probably would say, you know people in your family who used to come to church and don't come anymore. And at some point they fell away from the Lord and you are praying for them. I hope you're praying for them. My dad and my mum prayed for me for years. I want to talk to you this morning about a 10-year slot in my life. Now, I'm 77. I know I don't look it, but I'm 77. And when I was about 14, and I was living in Wood Green, North London. Does anybody know Wood Green? I was living in Wood Green, North London, near the Barrett Sweet Factory, and my dad was in the mission and his four kids were all growing up into their teens. And those teenage years can be very, very dodgy because especially if you grew up in the 60s, and I grew up in the 60s, the culture of the country and the world was changing. We had the Beatles. We had the Rolling Stones. And I was a huge fan of both. And when it came to sitting in church in my teens and listening to sermons, I'm not saying they weren't good sermons, but the life outside the church was so exciting. And I thought to myself, this is so boring, I don't want to be here anymore. I, as a young kid, yes, 
I'm sure I was sensitive to the Lord, and you are as a child. But as you go through puberty, as you grow up and you start noticing that there are other things called girls, <laughs> and as you start to develop as a man or a woman, your interests become more adult interests. And when the culture, as it was, was changing so much, and there was so much exciting stuff going on, when I was 14, my twin brother, I'm a twin, incidentally, my son David, who was recently ordained as an Anglican vicar, and he's in, he's in uh, where is he? He's over there, Lewisham. No, not Lewisham, where the airport is. I'm having a, a senior moment. Don't worry, my son's not part of this sermon. <laughs> But my son and his wife have been married for a year and they're expecting twins. What about that one? So here we are, and at 14 years old, in my dad's house in Wood Green, my brother, my twin brother and I, Peter and Paul, we went to my dad, who is the missionary, and we said, Dad, we know you believe in God and you want us to keep coming to church but we want to do other things on a Sunday. I want to go out with my mates. I want to go fishing. I used to love fishing. I want to do stuff that my mates are doing. And Dad was disappointed, but he said, I understand where you're coming from, but while you are still at school, while you're not earning your own keep, I'm going to expect you to go to church at least once on a Sunday. So from the age of 14 to 16, under duress, I kept going to church. I would sit in church counting the tiles on the ceiling. I forced myself, this is a dangerous thing to do. I was in services where I knew the Lord was speaking to me. I remember a baptismal service in the Baptist church we were going to during this period. And I felt this finger of God digging into my spirit and saying, it's your time. Surrender. Surrender to the Lord. And I said to the Lord, no, I want to live first. I want to do my own thing. I want to go my own way. And I wrestled the Holy Spirit out of my spirit when he tried to get to me. Now, that can be a very dangerous thing to do, as you will see from my testimony. So that was when I was 14. Get to the age of 16. I leave school. I start work. Happy days. Dad, no more church. I wasn't as joyous about that in front of my dad, but nonetheless, I stopped going to church from the age of 16 to the age of 24. And during that 10-year period, I'm going to include from when I was 14, because I, I switched off at the age of 14, and I was at about 10 years where I wasn't open to the Lord at all. And during that period, I left school, I went to work, I got in a dead-end job in an office in North London in Haringey, and then I heard that the Australian government were giving people the chance to go to Australia for... Ten pounds. I had ten pounds. <laughs> I wanted to go to Australia. And I had a friend that I was very buddy with at school. And I went round his house. He was an only child. I said to him, when we were younger, I said, we always used to say, say we would try and travel the world. He said, well, I said, well, look, look at this. Ten pounds, we can go to Australia. He was hooked. I was hooked. And we went to Australia House. We had an interview at the age of 18. And I got signed up with my mate to go to Australia. And in 1966, now in 1966, England won the yeah. World Cup. What was the score? Four. Well done. In 1966, in October, I woke up in the morning knowing that this was the day that I was leaving home. It's a bit like the prodigal son in the story. He said to his dad, I wish my dad had a lot of money, but he didn't. He said, can I take the money and I'm going to go? And he went and he spent it on riotous living. I went, to, 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 I went away, but not with the, the money as a backdrop. Nonetheless, 
uh, in October 1966. I woke up in the morning. My siblings, my brother, my older brother and my sister came with me along with some friends. I said to my mum and dad, you better not come to Southampton to see me off on the boat because you'll only get upset. So I talked them out of coming, which wasn't very nice, but that was the way I was doing it. And all my siblings and some friends, we piled into some cars and me and my mate went down to Southampton. And you've seen the images with people leaving on a boat with all the streamers and everything else. So there we were waving goodbye to all of our friends and the people that came. And then we were gone. And I thought, now, at last, I can see what the grass is like on the other side of the fence. I can live a life where I'm not constantly looking over my shoulder and have, having to restrict myself in what I would really like to do but can't do because I'm living at home. That's the prodigal son mentality. So for two years, I lived, two, two and a half years, I lived in Australia. And the first thing I did in Australia was we were put, my mate and I were put into a hostel for new migrants in Sydney. And two things happened in the hostel which are relevant. Number one, I met a girl who was going to become a long-term girlfriend. She was also a migrant. She, she was leave, leave, leaving England and she was a school teacher. But she, she, I got very friendly with her and eventually started going out with her. Number one at the hostel, that was in the first four weeks. Number two at the hostel, there were a couple there. The wife of this couple was a spiritualist. And as the, all of us were new migrants, all getting to know each other, chatting around the table for meals, she encouraged us to sit down and have what was really a seance while I was at the table. It's like the devil was trying to get his hooks in straight away. Because if you know your Bible, you'll know in Deuteronomy 18, it warns you about any intercourse with the spirit world. You mustn't dabble in the occult. You mustn't attempt to contact spirits of the dead and so on. So here I am. And even after the first landing and the first four weeks, I'm sitting at a table and I'm joining hands with this lady and we're sharing in a seance. There were two other occasions as I went through a kind of a spiritual search where I dabbled in the only two others. And twice I went on an Ouija board. And you know what, Ouija board, I'm not going to tell you what it is. But again, it's a way people try to contact the spirit world. We're talking about the lost son. This is the lost son for 10 years. Why? Because I turned my back on the Christian heritage that had been given me by God, and I said to God, no, no. Now, the Bible says that God will sometimes give you the desires of your heart, but he will send leanness to your soul. Do you know that scripture? He will send leanness to your soul. And what was going on in my life was partly God's permissive will to teach me that I had indeed turned my back on the light. And when you turn your back on the light, there's no other place to go but darker, 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 if you are talking in spiritual terms. So for two years in Australia, I lived, I won't go into all the details, I lived the life of a prodigal son. Not in a really deep way, I never got into drugs, but I got into gambling, I got into smoking, drinking, and all the stuff that I thought I'd love to have a try at. And I did have a try at. But after two years, I began to weigh things up inside my heart, honestly. Because I tasted this, and I tasted that, and I tasted some of that. But it didn't satisfy me. And what happened was, in my heart, I realised that there was a hole that needed to be filled. And I thought to myself, perhaps I should start looking at religion again. By this time, I'd come back from Australia and I was having a year where I'd set myself this goal where I would start to really seek the Lord. 
Charlotte, I think, quoted a verse, you know, you will seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Not half your heart. Now, if you want to know the Lord, you've got to seek him with all of your heart. The first great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. There's a lot of alls in there. And here I am, I've been brought by God to a place where I feel hungry. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 6, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. For they shall be filled. If you're not hungry for righteousness, there's no way God will fill you. But if you're hungry for righteousness, there's a very special experience waiting for you. Because God has promised, if you hunger for me and you thirst for me, I promise you I will fill you. We've been singing some lovely worship songs this morning. Miracle worker, way maker, light in the darkness. This is our God. This is the God that we come and worship on a Sunday morning. He is the miracle worker. He is the way maker. He is the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. So here I am. I'm at home and I'm about a year into my search. I've had a dabble with the occult in my period of time away from church. I've had a dabble on Ouija boards a couple of times. I thought it was a bit of fun, really. And I'm now trying out yoga as a religious thing doing exercises. But when you practice yoga, you're making positions that are in the positions of Hindu gods. And I would question whether yoga is something that a Christian should do. I know that's controversial, but I'm talking out of a backdrop of deliverance. I've been delivered, and it will come in my testimony in a moment, I've been delivered from an evil spirit in a very dramatic way. And I believe if you step in to the courts of Satan, you are in trouble. You are in trouble if you do it willfully, as I did, and you've turned away from light that God has given you, and you need to acknowledge that light, and you refuse to acknowledge it. So now I'm about a year after being in Australia, I'm back home, and I'm earnestly seeking the Lord. And I can't get through. I can't make sense of it. For a year, I, I, I was back at home again after my time in Australia, and I thought, I'm gonna, I've tried this other religious stuff, the Hindus and, and, and the yoga and all this other stuff. I'm going to start reading the New Testament again. I never did really read it myself. I was always told to go to church. But now I want to know if it's real. So secretly, I was back home, my dad and mum were there. Secretly, I started to read the New Testament. It was a battered old Bible, an AV version of the New Testament that used to be a soldier's version. But I picked the Bible that my parents would least likely miss. I took it out of the bookcase, I took it up to my room, and I started reading it. And for nearly a year, every night, I was ploughing through. It was like wading through treacle. I was saying, surely there's something in here. My parents have found faith in this book. Why can't I find it? Every now and again, as I was reading... Every now and again, there was a shaft of light coming through. And when it came through, it was always on the subject of repentance. I read the words of John the Baptist. John the Baptist said to those who came to him to be baptised, you brood of vipers. No point in me baptising you. You've got to bring forth fruit for repentance and people were coming to him soldiers were coming to him other people were coming to him and they were saying to him well what John what have we got to do and he was saying well, you've got to start living an honest life you've got to start being more caring you've got to start being more kind and when the Pharisees came to him he said you guys you're dressed up in your religious clothes but you need to bring forth fruit for repentance and those were the kind of passages that were touching me. I couldn't make head nor tail of the most of the rest of it. Anyway, in the end, I got so frustrated in my room one day, I cried out to God and I said, look, 
I've been genuinely searching for you if you're there. What have I got to do? It's like the, the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? What must I do? And as I said that, the Holy Spirit, before my conversion, convicted me of a particular sin that I could bring forth fruit for repentance about. Before I left for Australia, I was working in a menswear company and in order to get some free clothes, I stole some clothes out of the warehouse. I was in charge of the stock records and I could make clothes disappear, you know, just at a stroke of a pen. So I was going down in the warehouse before I went to Australia on my £10 passage deal. I'd never stolen before, but I thought this is a good opportunity. Remember, I've turned away from the light. So I'm going down in the warehouse in the lunch times. Anybody looking? No, there's a pair of Levi's, I'll have them. And I put them on under my own trousers. Oh, there's a nice shirt. I put that on under my own shirt. I went home at the end of the day and I gradually filled my suitcase for Australia up with all this stolen stuff. And I got away with it. Nobody knew about it. But the Lord knew about it. The Lord knew about it. Do you know it says in Psalm 139, he sees everything, even in the darkest corners of the earth. The darkness is like light to God. However thick the darkness is, God's x-ray eyes are looking straight in. And he's looking into your heart today. And he knows exactly who you are, where you are, why you are what you are. And he's reaching out his shepherd's arms to you this morning if you need him to. And he's saying to you, I'm knocking. I'm knocking on your door. Are you going to let me come in this morning? Because if you do, I can take the weight, the burden of sin out of your life and I can start to put you on straight and narrow way that leads to life. So I've got to hurry up. Time is going. So what happens is this. I've cried out to God, if you're there, I've genuinely, you know if you're there, I've been genuinely seeking you. And nothing, I've had nothing. What do you want me to do? And I get convicted about this sin. I can see myself going down into the warehouse three or four years before. I can see myself stealing from this, this company. And God seemed to say to me, by this influence, this spiritual influence in me, he's saying, if you want the real deal, you do what John told those Pharisees to do. You go and bring forth fruit for repentance. And I said, no way. <laughs> I'm not going to go back there. That can't be right. I'll oh, just forget about that. But it wouldn't go away. It would not go away. And I wrestled with it for about a week. And after a week, I gave in. I found myself in a phone box. We didn't have mobile phones in those days. I was in a phone box. I rung my old boss up. He was Jewish. Don't know if you've ever heard of Bricks Man Shops, but they used to have about 17 shops in London. And I'd worked for them for about four years, three, three years after school. So I rang him up and he said, I said to him, oh, Mr. Brick, I said, this is Paul. I, I used to work for you. I said, you know, I, I went to Australia. And I said, hello, Paul. He said, I thought you were still out there. I said, no, I've come home. He said, what can I do for you? I said, well, I'd like to come and see you. I didn't want to do it over the phone. I'd like to come and see you. He thought I wanted a job. So he said, OK, when would you like to come? So I made an appointment and I found myself in his office within a day or so. I sat down opposite his desk. His tea came in. I remember it clearly. He pushed his tea over to me. He said, you can have that. I'll get another one. And he got another cup. He said, now, what do you want? I said, well, you're going to think I'm absolutely balmy, I said. But the reason I've come here to you today, I'm saying this to a Jewish man. The reason I've come here today is that I want to become a Christian. <laughs> and I stole from you before I went to Australia. I stole from you. And I've come to start today to pay you back what I owe you. And I took a wad of notes out of my pocket. I put it on his desk. I said, that will cover it. I said, but if you want to charge me, you can. I said, but I want to make a clean breast of it. He pushed the money back. 
He said, all this religious stuff, he said, it's just come out of your background. He said, we don't, we don't want to worry about that. He said, but do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> I walked out of his office. I'd just got back from Australia, and I was going through this real difficult time searching for God. I walked out of the office with a job. I didn't really want to go back and work there, but I felt I had no option but to go back. I went and I still worked there for another couple of years. But this is the crucial part of the story. That same night, now remember, I've just brought forth fruit for repentance. The wonderful thing about fruit on a tree is that it is so evident. You know, Jesus went searching for figs on a tree once and he couldn't find any. But when you see a lovely apple tree or a pear tree and there's luscious fruit on it, that fruit is poignantly evident. And when persons really repent, it's evident. There's fruit that you see in their lives because they've turned a corner. I was turning a corner. That same night, after that afternoon, I'd been back and brought forth fruit for repentance. I was back at home. My older brother, Michael, who'd been saved at a Billy Graham rally while I'd been in Australia, he knew that I was trying to seek the Lord. And he took me up in the bedroom and he started really trying to help me spiritually. But no, it was the same as before. Nothing was coming through. After about an hour in the bedroom, we went down. My dad was in the front room. And they started talking. And they were trying to discuss the passage that he'd been talking to me about. Now, he'd been talking to me about being baptised in the Holy Spirit and being born again. And as they were talking about the Holy Spirit, suddenly, this is where it gets a bit spooky, folks. I'm not trying to frighten anyone, but this is what happened. As they're talking about the Holy Spirit, after I've repented, suddenly I feel something in my belly. In my belly. Something seems to slither up and grasp my vocal cords. And I heard a voice which wasn't mine. And it came out of my mouth and it said in a guttural voice, it said, it's all lies, speaking to my dad and my brother. They're talking about the spirit of God. They're talking about the baptism of Jesus. I've just been trying to get hold of all this stuff. But there's something in me that is the enemy of the Holy Spirit because I opened a door. Three times at least I went onto the occult platform, thinking it was a bit of a game. Now there's a voice coming out of my mouth that is saying, it's all lies. It's all lies. Kept repeating it. It's all lies. And my face, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of a medium in operation. I don't recommend it. But when they speak, they contort the face of the person that they're speaking through. And that's what was happening to me. So my brother rushed over to me. We were in the front room. We've just had this Bible study upstairs. My brother came over. He said, that's not your voice. He said, I know that's an evil spirit. He said, I've been reading in a newspaper article about a guy in Woodford who's just started helping people who've been dabbling in the occult. He said, that's an evil spirit. I'm going to try and cast it out. So he started praying over me, but nothing happened. Then my dad and my brother said, what we'll do is we'll contact this guy who lived in Woodford. So they rang him up and he started his journey over. This is about midnight at night now, so it's a bit like a horror film. So he's coming over to our house. He's coming over to our house to help me. And what happens is, as he's on his way in his car, I'm sitting on the armchair and I'm suppressing this thing so that it couldn't speak through me. And the thought came to me, I believe, from the Holy Spirit, the thought came to me, they've prayed for you, but you didn't pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. Now, the only prayer I knew was the Lord's Prayer. And I'm sitting on the armchair, and suddenly, spontaneously, my brother looked up a bit surprised, I started praying the Lord's Prayer. I said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Deliver us from evil. As I said the words, deliver us from evil, that spirit through me 
off the armchair. And I was, in a sense, it looked like I was having an epileptic fit on the floor. My feet were hammering, my body was shaking as this thing sought to go out of me in convulsions because I prayed. I'd prayed. No one can get you saved for you. You've got to get yourself saved by responding to Jesus yourself. Amen? That's the way it works. Jesus is standing at the door of individual hearts and he knocks. Sometimes he only has to knock softly, like Lydia in Acts 16. Sometimes he has to knock hard, like Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Both times Jesus was knocking. And both times Jesus came in, but they were very different. So I'm on the floor, I'm having this deliverance, I didn't know what it was, but I had been reading the New Testament and I knew that there were stories in the New Testament about this stuff going on. And I was associating what was happening with me with what I'd read in scriptures. Well, the interesting thing is that I thought the thing had gone at one point because I prayed. I stood up and I said to my brother, I think it's gone. I said, I I think it's gone. Then I felt a huge rush as it seemed to come back in again. And I remembered, because I'd been reading the New Testament, Jesus said, when the evil spirit goes out of a man, it wanders in dry places, seeking rest. Finding none, it will gather seven other spirits to it, and the eight of them will come, and they will all get back in and make you worse than you were in the first place. These are spiritual laws. These are spiritual truths. You don't hear them much in church, but they're taught by Jesus about deliverance. So when I felt this huge surge come again, I'm on the floor again. Not that I was thrown on there. I threw myself on there. And I kept saying the Lord's Prayer until this guy arrived. When the guy arrived, he worked out who I was, what was my name. And as um, he then came over to me, he said, now look, You've obviously opened up a door here for an evil spirit. He said, can you remember any incidents where you've dabbled in the occult? And immediately I felt of those three incidents. Once in a seance, twice on an Ouija board. He said, do you repent of having done that? I said, yes. And then he spoke, not in a loud voice, he spoke to the spirit. He commanded it to come out of me in the name of Jesus. I suddenly felt lighter. There was no manifestation. Then he put his hands on my head and then he prayed for me. He was a Pentecostal minister. He prayed for me to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And as he took his hands off me, I knew two things. I knew the evil spirit had gone and I knew that hole was now filled up with the Holy Spirit. And that was the beginning of my journey, having been a lost sheep for 10 years in a Christian home. And I say it to you this morning, I believe the Lord wants me to say as a warning, maybe to some, that if you've heard the Lord speaking to you and you're turning away, I would urge you, I can't make you, but I urge you to turn to the Lord and open your heart's door to him, let him come in and let him get his broom out and sweep you clean and let him fill you as he filled me with the Holy Spirit I'm done thank you very much
the goodness of God. I love your voice. And you have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no Of the goodness of God.